My name is Erica Tipton and I am a Title I consultant for the Title I Part A Support and Improvement Branch here at the Kentucky Department of Education. And I'm filling in for Aaron Suddeth and David Milanti, who are both out today. And um, before we get started, I will say that um, you may have just received an email from me and you may also receive an additional email from Aaron uh, at some point. It, we did try to schedule an email from Aaron for you to have the link for this PowerPoint and it is um, lost somewhere, somewhere out in the Ethernet world. So uh, if you get that second email, just disregard it. Um, but we are glad that you're joining us today for our August webinar. I cannot believe it's the last day of August already. If you're just joining us, please be sure to um, mute yourself. Uh, we will attempt to continue muting and turning off all mics or um, all mics and all cameras to allow participants to focus on the presentation. As always, we will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you'd like to unmute yourself at that time, just uh, type in the chat and we'll get you unmuted or use the raise hand function. You can also email me at erica.tipton at education.ky.gov and I'll check that email address at the end of the presentation as well. Be sure to check out last month's webinar if you weren't able to join us. We did talk about planning your activities for the upcoming year, hosting an effective Title I annual meeting, and devising a plan to cover the compact at conference time in relation to each child's academic achievement. Looking at today's agenda, we are going to be focusing on some reminders we're going to also talk about some August newsletter highlights. We're going to look at the carryover waiver for the 2022-2023 funds. And then my favorite topic of conversation, we will be spending most of the time this, this morning talking about purposeful parent and family engagement activities and the documentation of those activities. So first, for some reminders, the FY24 consolidated application was due in GMAP on August 11th. So if you have not already submitted that, please be sure to do that as soon as possible. Make sure to check the notes on the consolidated checklist if your application has been returned for any reason and resubmit after making corrections. And as always, reach out to your Title I consultant if you need assistance. Applications are reviewed in the order in which they are submitted, and we do appreciate your patience as consultants work to provide thorough reviews and constructive feedback on your application. If you haven't already had a chance to read the August newsletter yet, you can access it on our Title I Documents and Resources webpage. We leave all of our newsletters posted for one year. If you're not currently subscribed, you can do so directly through the newsletter, or you can reach out to Erin Suddeth and she would be happy to add you to the list. And don't forget to share pertinent newsletter articles with Title I principals or other staff who help collaborate on the Title I program, such as your homeless liaison, your foster care point of contact, or your finance officer. You don't have to be a Title I coordinator to subscribe. You may notice that there's a lot of overlap between the August newsletter and the webinar. These overlaps are intentional because we do want the two resources to support each other. Okay, so first order of business, we are going to talk about the carryover limitation. This can be found in section 1127A of ESSA. And that section states that no more than 15% of the Title I Part A funds allocated to a district for any fiscal year may remain available for obligation one additional fiscal year. This means that a district must ensure that at least 85% of Title I Part A funds are obligated for activities that occur no later than September 30th of the following year. So for last year's application, the FY23, um, that's the 310J funds, that time is coming up. That's September 30th of 2023, so next month. 
Now, as stated in ESSA in 1127C, this carryover limitation does not apply to districts that receive less than 50000 in Title I Part A funds. We do have a couple of those districts, but for the most part, the 15% carryover requirement will apply across the state. Typically, ESSA 1127B allows KDE to waive the carryover limitation for districts once every three years if the district meets the following conditions. So any district wishing to request a carryover waiver for 2022-23 funds may do so no later than September 30th of 2023, and you can do that by emailing David Milanti. In your carryover waiver request, your email must state that the district requests a waiver of the 15% carryover limitation for school year 2022-2023 funds. It must contain the reason for the excess carryover, and it must describe the plan for effectively using the carryover waiver, sorry, the carryover funds. You can see the Title I carryover information document and the April 2023 webinar on the Documents and Resources webpage for additional information on carryover. All right, so now we are going to switch gears um, away from the business and we're going to talk about the main um, purpose of today's webinar, which is to talk about planning and hosting purposeful parent and family engagement activities. Because so much of what we're going to talk about today actually involves school level implement implementation, we would strongly encourage you to go over this information with your principals at your Title I schools. And you may even want to share out the link to this webinar once it's posted. This would be good not only for new principals, but also for principals who've been around a while. To ensure effective and purposeful engagement activities, it is essential to go beyond social opportunities like grandparents breakfasts or muffins with mom and provide opportunities for parent education and support. And we'll get to that much in much more detail a little bit later. But the following slides will detail some guidance for Title I schools on implementing parent and family engagement activities. First, let's talk about establishing a welcoming environment. This is an absolutely foundational, important step before hosting any event. Some questions that you can ask yourself. What do parents see when they enter the building? Is pertinent information posted in a clear and easy to read manner? Or are there so many things posted that it's just overwhelming and confusing and you don't know where to look? Don't forget about the information that is required to be on display, such as the homeless education posters we discussed during the May webinar. Parents greeted and invited in. Does the environment or the vibe of the front office seem relatively calm, or is it frequently chaotic, noisy, or messy? Of course, there are going to be times when it gets hectic. That's the nature of a school building. But hopefully the majority of the time, you want to ensure the environment is one that doesn't put people on edge when they enter. And don't forget about representation. Keep in mind that some families may not have had positive school experiences in their own history, or they may find it intimidating to be in a school environment. Also consider families recently arrived to the country who are unfamiliar with the American school system. Make sure the school environment is warm and inviting and inclusive and isn't intimidating. Create spaces where parents and families feel comfortable and valued. Display information and materials and resources in multiple languages to accommodate diverse families. A seemingly small act, such as hanging flags in the entryway halls, representing the different languages spoken throughout the building, or a map with pins highlighting the countries, rep the countries represented in the building, goes a long way to helping people feel seen. Communicate effectively. This one cannot be stressed enough and frankly could be a webinar unto itself. But you want to establish a variety of clear channels of communication with parents and families. Utilize a variety of channels to share important information, 
event inv invitations and resources. One district we monitored in the past had an expectation district wide that if you haven't communicated any message in five different ways, you really haven't communicated it. Note that five isn't a required number. It's just the expectation that that particular district chose to enforce. You may want to consider adopting something similar. Schools should be using channels such as newsletters, emails, school websites, social media, flyers home, all calls, and messaging apps. Consider your community. Is the local newspaper still an active part of your community's culture? If so, use that as an additional method of communicating or perhaps the radio. Consider your audience as well. Many families have multiple children across potentially multiple schools within your district. So when each teacher uses a different messaging app, it does become overburdensome and frustrating for parents to receive information. Consider adopting one unified messaging app across the school or even across the entire district. And a little note about social media. It is an easy free tool, but don't rely so much on social media to get your message across that you're not using your other channels as well. With the rise in children being raised by grandparents or other extended relatives, keep in mind that not everyone uses social media. Um, and, if, and they may miss important information if you're relying too heavily on just that one channel of communication, especially if it's Facebook. And not just with our older generation, but now we've got a younger generation of families moving in who may not use Facebook and may opt for Instagram or Twitter or TikTok. So just because you post something on Facebook is not going to guarantee that everyone in your community will see it timely or even at all. Plus, Facebook al algorithms are super tricky and your posts can easily be buried for many of your followers. And even smartphone savvy, savvy guardians may miss some important messages or they may dislike discussing sensitive topics online and they, they may prefer uh, a face-to-face -face phone call, a, a note home. Um, traditional ways of mailing notices or slipping something into a student's folder continue to be the best means of communicating with grandparents or with other relatives raising kids. Get information to your families in a way that the rest of the world isn't using anymore. Ensure that all communications are available in multiple languages to enhance accessibility and to ensure that parents are informed. Offer parent workshops. Organize workshops and training sessions that address relevant topics for families. Along with your math or your literacy nights, consider workshops like effective parenting strategies, supporting academic success at home, using positive behavior intervention strategies at home, or understanding the school curriculum. Poll parents to gauge their needs and interests for workshop sessions. Some requests we've seen families in, from seen from families include school safety, mental health awareness, cyber safety, understanding IEPs, or even CPR training. Collaborate with community organizations or professionals to provide expertise and resources. Bottom line, parent events should go beyond the social events we often think of first, like a veterans luncheon or donuts with dad, and should actively engage parents in learning. One way that community organizations and local businesses sometimes participate in P PFE events is by providing a meal. We're all aware of that catch 22 that federal funds can't be used to purchase meals, but meals are a great way to increase attendance. So pairing your Title I event with a meal purchased or donated by an outside entity is one way to provide a meal and increase attendance without uh, risking misusing Title I funds. When advertising your events, be sure to give adequate notice to families. Keep in mind that many families are juggling other outside activities after school, and they may need quite a bit of advance notice to be able to attend a, a school event. Provide supports for parents. 
recognize that parents may face challenges and provide avenues for support. Some districts have collaborated with local agencies like libraries, extension offices, counseling centers, and organizations such as the Relatives as Parents program to provide avenues where parents can share their experiences, seek guidance, and connect with other parents facing similar situations. Partnering with local agencies or organizations to expand available resources is a great opportunity to collaborate with your counselors and your family resource center staff to offer family family events that may need may meet the needs of families and provide ongoing support long after your event has ended. Provide opportunities for parental involvement in decision making. Ensure that you're reaching beyond your SBDM counsel. Empower all parents to participate in the school decision making processes. Invite them to serve on advisory boards, parent teacher associations, or other school committees. Solicit their feedback on school policies, programs, and initiatives to ensure that their voices are heard and valued. When you host meetings, keep in mind the schedules of working parents. For example, hosting all SBDM council meetings directly after school may support your teachers, but may pose a barrier for working parents who want to participate. To accommodate both groups, you may consider alternating your meeting times every other month. For example, a 3.30 meeting one month and a 6 p.m. meeting the next. Beyond meeting times, ensure that other barriers to participation are removed. For example, could you provide childcare or transportation? Foster partnerships with parents. Beyond involvement with decision making, develop meaningful partnerships with parents by involving them in school activities, events, and programs. Encourage their participation in classroom volunteering, mentoring programs, career days, and extracurricular activities. Collaborate with parents to organize family-oriented events. For example, if your school community has a diverse culture, host a multicultural celebration where families can share their own culture. Organize cultural awareness events, heritage celebrations, or even language exchange programs to promote understanding and respect among students, parents, and staff. In addition, you may want to consider hosting some parent events that may not involve students. For example, a session covering online safety would be a great parent and family engagement event, but parents may need a little more in-depth information geared toward what to be on the lookout for, while students may need more basic do's and don'ts of how to be safe on the internet. This is a great opp opportunity to offer childcare accommodations so that parents may have a learning session uninterrupted. Another example we've seen from a district is hosting a first aid class, which was a request from parents. Being able to focus attention on safety procedures without having to supervise your children at the same time is important. Students may also need learning in first aid and safety, but on a more age appropriate level. Don't forget that covering childcare costs or paying staff stipends to run age appropriate activities in tandem with your parent activities is an allowable use of funds and a great way to encourage parent participation by removing a barrier. Promote home to school collaboration. Encourage ongoing collaboration between parents and teachers to, to support student learning. Provide resources and strategies for parents to engage in educational activities at home. Establish a system for regular parent-teacher conferences to discuss student progress, set goals, and address any concerns. And keep in mind that parent conferences should be offered to all families, not just the families of your students who are falling behind. If that's hard to fit in a one-night parent conference event, consider, consider hosting a week-long conference event by appointment or host a data night in which students can participate in explaining their own progress to their families while teachers are meeting with others. Evaluate and adjust your efforts. Continuously assess the effectiveness of your parent and family engagement activities. 
collect feedback from parents, teachers, and students to understand their experiences and identify areas for improvement. Use this feedback to refine your strategies and ensure ongoing growth and, and success. And we'll talk a little bit more about surveys on the next slide when we talk about documentation. Take stock of your attendance rates and evaluate where and how you can increase attendance. So how can you measure effective engagement activities? Keep these three things in mind. Well, there are four. <laughs> Remember, effective parent and family engagement activities should be communicated well. They should be inclusive of all families and should seek to remove any barriers of participation. Activities should be collaborative and should address the needs expressed by your community. And ultimately, your events should always be focused on enhancing student academic and social emotional outcomes. By providing opportunities for parent education and support, Title I schools can foster strong partnerships that positively impact student achievement and overall student culture. There are many guiding questions you can ask yourself as you're planning Title I parent and family events. And here are just a few that we, we recommend, but there are potentially so many more questions you can ask. You can ask yourself, what identified need are we addressing? What information is being shared with parents? Will parents leave the event with a new skill or a practice they can use at home to help their child's academic achievement? How are we using the Title I Parent and Family Engagement Funds to support this event? And is this event more than just for entertainment or social purposes? And that last bullet brings us to a very important topic. Entertainment or social events. In the uh, Code of Federal Regulations 2 CFR 200.438, it states that costs of entertainment including amusement, diversion, and social activities, activities, and any associated costs are unallowable with federal funds. Title I Part A funds may not be used for any costs related to entertainment or social events. Social events are used to get to know families and to build relationships relationships with parents and there's a lot of value in events like that but they do not meet the intent and the purpose of title one just because participants leave the event with a book or an educational resource does not automatically make that event allowable to be paid with title one funds parents do need to have some type of value provided to them within the event uh, and not just a take away um, physical um, make and take or a book. Title I events should move from social or entertainment events uh, like dances or school carnivals or movie nights or breakfasts and should move toward events that enhance student outcomes. So is it tied to a, academics like a math night or a science night? Um, is there a digital literacy or an internet safety component? Um, have we done trauma informed practices, social emotional learning, mental health? As you plan and conduct your events, you need to also think about appropriate documentation. When we come to monitor, schools and districts are asked to provide documentation of parent engagement events. A common form of documentation that we see a lot is photographs, but photographs alone don't provide enough contact, context or detail to adequately document that an event has occurred. If you do keep photographs as evidence for your events, um, we recommend that you add some captions for context and that will elevate that piece of documentation. From start to finish, hold on to event evidence. How were parents made aware? Save your announcements, again, from your multiple channels of communication. Be able to show your social media posts, your newspaper announcements, your flyers, your emails, your texts, your newsletters, your messages in the school messaging app, all of that. When hosting meetings, make sure you have an agenda 
and keep detailed minutes. Minutes should document the purpose of the meeting, the attendees, and a general idea of what happened, and hang on to those sign-in sheets. One thing to elevate your sign-in sheets is to make sure that you have the roles indicated. Often when we come to monitor, we just see a list of names, and it's not clear to us if there were parents or if it was just school administration and teachers. So having those roles delineated on your sign-in sheets is very important. When sending surveys, be able to show the multiple avenues by which that survey was communicated. Be prepared to answer questions like, how were families made aware of this survey? How long did they have to respond? What was your response rate? If the response rate was low, what changes do you plan to make to improve participation? Surveying parents throughout the year, rather than just once at the beginning or once at the end of the year, is also re recommended so that the school can engage in continuous improvement. Be sure to also provide evidence of how those survey results were analyzed and used to inform better practices for the upcoming school year. During monitoring, monitoring, we will want to see more than just surveys. We'll want to see how you used them. Hang on to things like agendas and detailed minutes of discussion occurring around those survey results, and maybe have a list of actions taken based on those survey results. That was a lot to unpack, but that is the end of our material, so I'd I'm, I'll check real quickly, but I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Are there any questions as we wrap up? I don't think I'm seeing any in email as well. Okay, if there are no questions this morning, I want to thank you again for joining us and remind you of our upcoming webinars. So make sure you mark your calendar for all of those dates. As a reminder, we do value your feedback and would always like to learn more about what's helpful and what you would like to see more of in our monthly webinars. Comments and ideas and questions can be submitted through our optional and anonymous webinar feedback survey. A link to the survey is available in the most recent Title I newsletter. And I'm still not seeing any more questions. So with that, we will wrap up and have a great afternoon, a great day. Thank you.